know that uh, recording has started. This meeting is being recorded. So hello, everyone. Uh, those probably do or do not know me. I'm Jervis Johnson, or Gervais, or Jay. Jay is my nickname. So many, many years ago, many of us, Ron and Gopal and others, have started this uh, this community and this meetup, and it's a, uh, we call it Enterprise Agile Global. It's, it's about um, agile, lean agile transformations for generally large companies, large organizations, uh, and many organizations that have been around for you know 40, 50, 60 years, and they have to change, right? Um, and and what's involved with that? We always have uh, great uh, speakers and, and innovators and educators come on board and, and share thoughts and wisdom uh, to the community. And that's what we're doing today. Um, so just to let everyone know, many of us have been doing this for 20 plus years, 30 years, 40 years for some of us. Well, I, I don't want to use the number anymore. So, um, so we always want to learn what's what's new, what's exciting, what's going on, what what are some of the interesting intricacies that are involved in, in cultural change. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to whom? Gopal Ron to introduce our guest today. To Gopal. Gopal. Yay. I've been nominated. <laughs> So welcome everyone. I uh, want to uh, shout out a real thanks to Sherry and Alex for spending their Tuesday afternoon with us or evening. They're actually in the central time zone. So it's uh, late in the evening. So appreciate you guys taking the time and talking to this group. Um, we definitely are extremely interested about this topic about enterprise coaching because we focus on enterprise agile and this is you know ex near and dear to our hearts um sherry i met sherry about four years ago in an agile conference in california and um, you know extremely impressed by what she brings to the table how she approaches the problem how she communicates um down to earth approach as well as the uh, crisp communication uh, and the examples she brings to the table. So uh, really impressed. And uh, just to call out one thing, she is one of the original masters, what is it, master certified coaches from ICF. And there are only a few in the world and she was one of the first ones to get that. And uh, both Sherry, Alex and Michael who couldn't join us today, they have written a book about the enterprise agile coaching using an invitational approach. I really love the book. It's a thick book, but it's an easy read. You yeah, big words. It. Yeah. Big letters. Big <laughs> letters, lots of examples. We, we made sure that it's it's very big letters. <laughs> I have all <old> those. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's about Sherry. Alex has many, many years of consulting experience, coaching experience, and... Um, you know, for the first time I'm meeting Alex and I am, I'm sure I will be equally thrilled by the, you know, what, what do you bring to the table as well? Alex is a partner of Sherry in the Tandem Coaching Academy. So welcome Sherry, welcome Alex, please take it away. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's good to see you all and, um, and be here for this, some of a, what of a panel discussion tonight. And so what we'll do is, We'll um, introduce a little bit about the thoughts that we had going into the book, and then we will ask for, what do you want to know? What can we help you with? So um, as Gopal mentioned, I'm Cherie Silas, and I am an enterprise coach. I worked in the agile field for, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years, coaching and agile. And um, yes, I, I am one of the first MCC Agile coaches. Um, I'm not one of the first MCC coaches, but I'm the first um, enterprise coach in the world that's an MCC. Alex is the second or third person who was- Third, I missed I miss the second by two months. You missed the second by two months. Man, almost- I was like, damn it. <laughs> so, um, and um, yeah, so I, my, I focus- mainly on helping to develop other coaches, people who love this work and want to do this kind of work. 
And my big passion is to see coaching in the agile space. Right? So there's a lot of people doing this, um, what they, we call agile coaching work, but they don't necessarily understand coaching. And so I have a really big passion around helping people to really understand what coaching is and how they can leverage that to be even better um, at the work they do as organizational and agile coaches. And um, Alex, I'll let you tell a little bit about you before we jump into what we wrote together. Sure. Um, so I spent years doing software development. Uh, at some point, I decided that software development is somewhat boring and I need something more exciting in my life and found the whole agile thing. And that was a big disappointment. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it ended up being something on the crossroads between Agile and software development. Uh, so I still um, run the software development organizations and helping them becoming Agile as probably as an afterthought, because as we're talking through this, uh, you'll probably get that our approach that Agile is never the goal. Um, a lot of agile coaches come to the organization with, well, you have to be agile. That's never an organizational goal. Organizational goal is money, is social impact, is um, making some other impact, right? Uh, and as part of my becoming an agile coach, um, the professional coach was pretty much a checkbox on the long list of things that I needed to go through. And I did my training with Cherie and um, kind of stuck around. I guess she did something right. Um, and so a um, couple of years ago, we organized uh, Tandem Coaching Partners and Tandem Coaching Academy uh, as the way to bring more professional coaching practices to the Agile community. So that's where we come from. Yes. And so last year, uh, almost a year now, in, in I think we released it December 15th of last year, um, our book on Enterprise Agile Coaching, or an, in, yeah, Enterprise Agile Coaching. And there was a reason behind us writing this book. So we both got experience and Michael de la Maha, um, who wrote the book with us, we all have experience working in organizations as agile coaches, as enterprise coaches, as um, agilists helping to make the world a better place. And we, we started seeing trends, at least I could speak for myself. I started seeing trends several years back when I worked with people. And what I was noticing was that there were different types of coaches. There were some coaches who took a more professional coaching approach, which I subscribe to. And then were other coaches who took a more top-down consulting, um, I'm the expert, follow my rules, do it my way. I'm going to tell you how to fix your company. I'm going to tell you how to fix your agile. Um, a more forceful approach, which is fine. Um, it's an approach and it's a great consulting approach. Um, in my opinion, it's just not coaching. It's different, right? Consulting is a valid career and it's consulting. It's not coaching. But the thing that was interesting to me was that over time, watching clients and watching what happened with clients that used to be clients and, and we had finished was I started to notice um, that the people who were in, in, in the, on the ground that seemed to be getting really fast um, results. So I worked with some organizations where I had other coaches and they were like top down. Um, and they were, you know, kind of the attitude of, well, if you don't listen, I'm just going to tell your boss, you don't listen, you're not coachable. And then you'll either listen or you'll get another job, right? They got a lot of change really fast. But when they left, even when they walked out the door and went to the other room, People would just go back to what they were doing because they didn't believe in what they were being forced to do. They got compliance, but what they didn't get was sustainable change. 
And then I noticed that people that I was working with and other coaches like me, people who they were working with, they, it, it took longer. Let's just be honest. It took longer for them to change. Things happened slower. But when I left, not, it didn't roll back. I mean, everything, some, a little bit of roll back, you know, as people are human, it's normal. But for the most part, things stuck. Stuck to the point where I've left companies who, when the company gets a new leader and the leader decides we're not doing this agile thing, we're going to work a different way because it's better. People who had spent 20, 25 years working for that company, an entire career working for that company said, no, we won't go back to that. And they left and came and found me where I was working and started working with me again, right? And so it was the impact of a different approach that created the sustainable change. And so what we wanted to bring into the world was just that, that as an agile coach, when you leave, the changes should not roll back. And if they do, there's something wrong. Right? It's not about how fast we can do it. It's not about you must be agile. Like Alex said, agile's not the goal. If agile is the goal, you've got the wrong goal. The goal is business results. Agile is a mechanism. It is one mechanism that helps you to get business results. It's not the only mechanism. And in and of itself, it doesn't create business results. And if, if you're trying to gain compliance to some thing, some agile framework, then, then you're doing it wrong, right? Agile, our goal is to solve problems and to help people get closer to business results. If agile helps, great. If it doesn't, that's cool too. But we want to we want to get business results, right? and so we wanted to bring this information out into the world because um, Alex and I set out on a mission to change the world of of coaching, right? Of agile coaching, so that people could understand that coaching is different than consulting, and um, so that's kind of where we started. Alex, what do you want to add to that? So it's interesting that. Well, I guess a lot of people make money these days as agile coaches, right? And I see better return on your investment in your education and in probably your passion. And I don't know what drives everybody in this room. Um, what drives me is money and actually easy life easy kind of getting things done and easy results, right? And Agile is the thing that helps me get those easy, easier results. Let me put it that way, right? And so uh, when I come to the organization and um, when I see people are like, we are going to be Agile, we are going to be doing this and that. And sometimes I hear we're Agile, we have daily stand-ups on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And sometimes I see some reasonable things that are going like we're agile. What I'm not interested in is what you do. I don't care if you do Kanban. I don't care if you do Scrum. I don't care if you do, God forbid, safe or whatever. What I care and what my first question is, what do you get out of that? How did your life change from where you were where you weren't agile or whatever, to where you are right now, and what's your path going forward. And if you think about that, uh, and we are on the mission of bringing more professional coaching to the agile world, because we do believe that professional coaching skills are crucial, not only to sustainable change, which is the core kind of our message, but also to our better enjoyment and quality of life as we go through engagement or as we go through employment with other people, with other organizations, because it really sucks. It really sucks to be solving problems for other people and be this all no kind of be all and all guy who knows everything 
and who ends up being the smartest guy in the room. It sucks. What's so much better and so much easier on your psyche is to adopt the professional coaching stance where one of the core competencies, absolutely core to the, to the bone of professional coaching is being comfortable in the space of not knowing. I don't know, and I'm perfectly comfortable. As they say, the masterful coaches trust the process more than they trust themselves. I trust that if I bring the knowledge of the process and focus on the right thing and help people to focus on those things, I will be successful and I will, I will work so much less hard I keep telling our students that coaching is the lazy profession. That's one of the reasons I picked it, right? So long story short, if you are an agile coach and you find yourself working hard and you are exhausted, well, maybe something is missing. Something is missing from your toolbox. Something is missing from your set of competencies. And what Shuri and I figured out kind of a long time ago by now and practiced it uh, for quite some time that if you remember uh, Lisa Atkins kind of X-wing model uh, and the four, what she calls four pillars or whatever that's um, four stances of agile coach, right? So you have your content where you train and where you mentor and you have your process where you coach and where you facilitate and one or more kind of knowledge pillars, it's business process and technology, right? So what we see, and we see so many coaches getting so big a return on their investment, uh, not only monetary, but also life enjoyment, also enjoyment of what they're doing, from focusing on that missing piece on that quadrant of professional coaching, and applying that. And if you are interested and if you start digging into that professional coaching stance, what you will realize that it's a double-edged sword. You can use that to help your clients, to help your organizations achieve their goal. And guess what? Professional coach, coaching doesn't come with a footnote, never use for your own benefit. There is no asterisk, there is nothing, right? So when you learn professional coaching skills, when you learn these competencies and competencies, we call them muscles because we can teach you, we, you can come to class, you can spend six months with us in the class and you will not be coaching. The only way for anybody to work on their competencies and build their competencies is to coach. That's kind of novel concept, right? To become a coach, you must continuously coach nonstop. And the more you coach, the better you become. Remember the being comfortable in the space of not knowing? That's, that's an earned competency. That's, that's hard, right? So uh, as you're practicing this, I can guarantee that your hair will grow back, your teeth will be whiter. <laughs> well, that I cannot guarantee but your quality of life will be, of professional life will be so much better as an agile coach. And I cannot guarantee that, but I saw so many examples and so many confirmations of this statement that your personal life will be better. Mm -hmm. Professional coaching is a life-changing competency. You will be listening differently, you will hear different things. You will communicate differently. And as Sheree is saying, uh, saying uh, she talked to spouses of some of our students and they were saying, I don't know what you do with him in your class, but do more of that, please. <laughs> so uh, professional coaching, not only a huge contribution to agilists and their profession and their ability to make a long lasting and sustainable impact, but it's also a contribution to personal life, to personal goals and 
to you as a human being. And I will shut up now because I spent, what, <laughs> eight minutes talking nonstop? Right. Yeah. So, so professional coaching is, it's, it's cool, right? And, and it helps you. It's good communication skills and it helps you to listen and be curious and put the client in the driver's seat. Agile coaches who, are, you know, I talk to a lot of coaches who are like, hey, help, you know, this is the problem I have and talk to me about it. What can I do about it? And one of the big problems that people say is, well, I can't do coaching because my client just wants me to tell them what to do. Right. They want me to, they, they, they tell me, you go fix my agile and I'm going to go do my job, basically. And, and so I get that. And it's also because we train our clients to do that. Right? I come and I'm the superhero and I know everything and I'm going to fix your world and I'm going to tell you how to do it. And you know what? I want you to know that I'm good. So I'm going to do you. Great. You go do that. And I'm going to go do something else. Right. And, and then, and so we build that around ourselves where people are looking to us to be the expert. Now, don't get me wrong. When people hire you as an ad coach, especially an enterprise coach, you must have the chops behind you to be able to tell them, hey, you know, like to give um, professional opinions. I, I, I have people come to me often who are like, I'm this other kind of coach and I never worked an agile in my life and I want to be an agile coach. Can I do that tomorrow? No, you can't. You, you've, got to have, you've got to build that knowledge and expertise in. And having it and always spouting it is totally different. Right. And so, so as we're working as enterprise coaches, the value we bring is to let our knowledge inform our questioning, let our knowledge inform the observations we're making, and use our knowledge when needed to say, okay, well, here's my opinion on this. This is what I think you need, right? This is my recommendation. And what do you want to do with that recommendation? Right. How would something like that work here? Right. If, you, if they're not able or willing to do it, that's okay too. Right. It's their company, it's their business. The key is there, there's a few things that are keys to being successful as a, um, as a enterprise coach or an adult coach. One is rather than taking this knowledge you have and saying, this is how you do it. And it must be like this. Here's all the problems I see. This is not agile. That's not agile. That's not agile. That's not agile. And telling people what's broken and how to fix it. That doesn't generally go over well. That generally causes resistance. And people are like, why, why are you coming here telling me what to do? You don't even know my job. You don't know my life. Why are you telling <laughs> me wrong, right? They, that's not helpful. What is the more successful way of doing this is to ask them what's painful, what's broken, what doesn't work, what can I help you with, what can we brainstorm on, what keeps you up at night, let's work on solving that together. And the secret that they don't know that you will know after this moment is that you're going to tell them the same stuff you would have told them even when you didn't know their problems. Because what people are, what you're doing when you come and you're like, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, do this, do this, do this, those are solutions. The problem is not that you don't have the right solutions, the problem is that the client doesn't know what the problem is. And when you help them to see what the problem is, and then you offer a solution, now they see the helpfulness of it. When you come in and offer solutions, and they don't even know they have a problem, they're like, why are you making me do this thing? That, that why are you making me do this? Like, I was happy over here. But when they see the problem and you offer a solution, they're like, great, let's do that. At the end of the day, the same stuff gets done. One way it gets done with resistance and one way it gets done without resistance. Choose the path of least resistance and you'll go further and you'll stay there. As I said, be lazy. That's right. The path of least resistance is being lazy. and uh there's there's a good saying well some somebody said in professional coaching environment and we kind of picked it up and it's a little bit kind of tongue in the cheek that do not trust your client do not believe 
than what they tell you. Because they will tell you that our problem is that Agile doesn't work. And you'll be like, yay, Agile doesn't work. This is not Agile. This is not Agile. When I hear that, I'm like, so what? OK, this is not Agile. So what? What do you want to do with that? You want to install Agile? Tell me how my life will change. When this is going to be Agile versus this not Agile? Again, Agile is never a goal. It's never a business outcome. It's never a business goal. Uh, somebody recently in a professional Scrum Trainers channel asked, have you ever seen the direct connection between people practicing good professional Scrum and their, I think they asked like share price. And like, this is so divorced from any, from any kind of real life question that I don't really believe somebody with PST kind of asked that question. And the reason I'm saying don't trust them, they will tell you a solution. They want a solution. Agile is a solution. We want agile. Great, that's a solution to what problem? Okay, let's step back. You're not agile right now. So what do you see around you that you're unhappy with? Now you start having a conversation. Well, we were told that agile is we deliver value early and often. I literally had this conversation with the director from Fortune 100. We were told that agile will see value early and often. We are nine months into this. We train everybody to use Azure DevOps and we see nothing. Okay, that's a problem. The problem is not that you're not agile. You don't see anything in production. Great, what else? What else don't you see? Or what else would you like to see, regardless of whether you're agile or not? And by questioning this, notice that I'm not saying that like, no, 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 you don't need agile. That's not the problem. Great, you want to be agile. I would agree with you. Being agile is great. It's a great... Uh, it's a great tool, it's a great strategy to be more competitive in the market, maybe. Great. What is that you want to see when you're agile? These kind of questions drive to the heart of the problem and people start realizing we don't deliver. People are not happy. We don't know what our product is. I see this all the time. Like companies like, we are a product company. What is a product, right? So when you drive to these questions and uh, in the book, we describe an absolutely fantastic uh, tool that is borrowed from uh, neuro-linguistic programming, the well-formed outcomes. And it's somewhat somewhat heavy tool. Uh, it's It has several, I don't remember, like nine or 10 steps, right? Uh, I don't do that like really often probably when I start an engagement and when I I know that people want to invest a lot of money. And my selling point to that tool is like, look, I have this tool. It's actually exhaustive and exhausting. By the time we are done, you will know so much more about your outcomes and you will be exhausted because you're like, are we there yet? You remember the donkey in Shrek? Are we there yet? No. I was there at no, we still have a couple more steps to explore. So driving towards the clear understanding of outcomes rather than solutions. And solutions, maybe somebody sold them this solution. Maybe they heard about this solution from somebody. Solution is never a problem you as an agile coach want to solve. Unless they hire you as an agile coach to install Scrum. You know what? That's a great job. And that's actually a great engagement if you're in business of installing Scrum. There is nothing wrong with installing high quality, kick ass Scrum. Just be cognizant of what you are hired to do. If you are coming to the organizations thinking, I will be a part of the great agile transformation and I will be so valued as an agile coach and you left with installing Scrum, there is a lot of disappointment that awaits you right there. 
So when you come to the engagement, have a conversation, have a call. Remember I said that coaching competencies go both ways? Interviews are absolutely fantastic places to use coaching competencies for your uh, advantage. Because when you, when you have professional coaching competencies, you actually know how to ask the right questions and here you ask them for your own benefit because you actually understand what you want to get out of those questions. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to shut up another mm -hmm. eight minutes. Um, it's great. I'll add one more point then we want to open it up for questions here. Um, I think first an example to what Alex just said um, about these interviews. So I just started working with a new client the last couple of weeks and I did a couple of days of interviews and understanding their world so that we could put together like what does this engagement look like? What, what, what do we have on our hands and where are we going? Mm -hmm. I sat down with the, um, with the C-level C people today and just kind of walk them through. Okay, I talked to people, you know, three days last week, three days the week before, and here's what I know um, about your company. You tell me if this is right. I mean, uh, here's the problems you said you had. Does this seem right to you? And so we can figure out a direction. The response that I got and the one I generally get is um, I'm, I'm about a third of the way through talking through it. And the CIO is just like, grinning ear to ear and I was like what's going on over there she's like I can't believe that after talking to people for six days you know our company this well and you understand our problems this well like it, it was shocking and I get that response all the time the funny part is all I'm telling them is what they told me the difference is I'm listening and asking the right questions right and so now we really understand what this engagement's about um, another key here that I want to bring to the table for us to look at is one of the things that frustrates adult coaches um, is that they don't always realize what type of engagement they're in, right? And so from, from my perspective and my experience, there are three types of engagements. What I find is that when I talk to coaches in the industry, I talk to most coaches, and I'm going to say 80% or more of coaches, when I ask them what they're doing, they're like, I'm doing an agile transformation for so-and-so company. I'm working on so-and-so with agile transformation. We're doing a transformation. Okay, cool. What's interesting is that when I talk to clients, and I talk to a lot of clients and potential clients, it is rare that somebody actually wants agile transformation. They generally want usually adoption and sometimes just process adoption. And so it's really helpful to understand the different types of engagements and, and where people fit in. So if we look at different types of coaches. So we've got process adoption. I want to bring Scrum to my world. How do you know you have a process adoption? Well, a process adoption is focused on your agile teams, probably just engineering. If they have product owner-ish person, they probably report to engineering, not to product. They, um, and what they want is for you to teach them Scrum. Scrum's gonna fix our world. We wanna know Scrum. We, we don't wanna make any other big changes. We know Scrum is gonna, that's all we wanna do is just get things running better. We want you to come teach us Scrum. There is nothing wrong with that. And if that's what you like and that's what you want to do and you want to train people to do Scrum and work with them a bit and help them at the team level get Scrum done, fantastic. Do that. It's fun, right? And so what kind of coach is needed for that? Maybe you're just a really good Scrum master and you can do that. And so you're at that team level coach, like a Scrum master who's focused on the team and, yep, I'm going to teach these teams how to do this. We're going to get Scrum running and we're going to do great and all is well. That's a process adoption engagement. Now, if you go into that engagement thinking I'm, and you're the coach and you're like, I'm doing agile transformation 
and what the company wants is process adoption, you will be really frustrated when managers don't change things. You're going to be frustrated when they keep taking people off of teams and moving them to other teams. You're going to be frustrated when, when you hit the ceiling and you can't do something because there's impediments outside the team that's slowing them down. Because that's not what they called you to do. They called you to do process adoption. And they didn't intend to change anything outside of that. And if you go into it knowing that, understanding that, and recognizing that that's fine, we're going to get this far, and then we're done, you won't be frustrated. And if your client knows that going into it, they won't be frustrated and think you didn't do your job because you both know I can do this for you and then it's going to stop right here. When we hit this ceiling, that's it. The work's done unless you want to do something else. The next level is agile adoption. And in my experience, this is what most clients want. And agile adoption generally focuses on engineering and product I say it kind of squishy because not all companies have a product organization. Um, it's usually a business and engineering, or maybe they have product and engineering, whatever, but it's usually right there, right? And, and your highest level stakeholder is generally the leader of the engineering department, maybe the, maybe the product group, Right? But they're not full company. They're not usually like, I, I run the whole company. They run engineering. They run product uh, the product area. And in adoption, your highest level stakeholder is usually the managers right above the agile teams or the second level manager. So that's important to understand because you can only make the change that's attached to the level of power your top person who you who wants this thing to happen has. If it's a first or second level manager, the reason why the ceiling hits after the team gets starts adopting Scrum is because that manager doesn't have the power to do anything different. When you get into agile adoption and you're working at the whole department level, now the, that director, VP, whatever it is, they have a lot of power. And they have the power to change their organization. They have the power to change organizational structure. They have power to change, you know, budget and how many people are working there and whatever else. They have the power to say, we're going to do this with technology and we're going to invest here in technology and we're not going to invest there, and you know, all that stuff. And so people who are looking for agile adoption, they actually want to make change. They, they're willing to change technology. They're willing to change organizational structure. They're willing to change what people are responsible for. They want to change the culture of their organization. They want to change the way they think about doing things, right? And that's great. And you can get a lot done with agile adoption. It's a very successful place to be. And it's a lot of work. And it's fun. Wonderful place to be. The challenge that I have and what you as an agile coach will be frustrated about if you think you're doing a transformation and you're doing an adoption is that your ceiling is going to come into play. At the top level, let's say the, um, the person who's like the top level is a VP of engineering, right? Whatever, where their power stops is where the change stops because they may be able to influence, but they can't dictate change. And so what will happen is you'll get to this ceiling where we've got all this stuff working great. And the thing that's holding us back now is the way the finance department wants to um, fund our projects. It's the way we look at, you know, capitalization. Um, it is the job descriptions and the people we're hiring and the way we pay them. We want people to work in teams, but we're compensating them to work as individuals against each other. We put people in a bell curve and say, if you're the superhero, you make money and the rest of us don't. And then we want to know why they're not working as teams. Right? We've got matrix organizations, like all the things that are beyond this. We've got sales teams that are out selling stuff and telling clients, we can do that and we can have it to you in three months. And then they come tell engineering, do that in three months. Okay, 
right? It, or we've got legal departments who are still writing waterfall contracts with vendors and we're trying to do agile. All that stuff goes beyond engineering, beyond product. This is where enterprise coaching comes in. I, there are a lot of people who are saying they're enterprise coaching. Really, they're not coaching the enterprise. They're coaching the organization. They're doing agile adoption, which is great. It, it, enterprise is a bit different, right? It's beyond that stuff. It's the stuff outside of engineering, outside of product, as well as product and engineering, as well as agile teams. It, it's the bigger picture of the whole system. And so you cannot do agile transformation unless the people at the very top who have the power to make all those decisions and make all those investments say, we actually want to change everything about the way we do business. That is rare. And it's a small percentage. And it generally doesn't happen in these humongous companies. It's generally in smaller companies because they've, they've got the power. And the bigger the company, the more structure and politi pol politics and all that stuff is there. Right? So really important to understand the differences to save yourself some frustration. When we engage with clients, we're really clear on what, on what they're asking for because they all, many of them will come and say, we want to do agile transformation. What does that mean to you? Well, we want our people, our teams doing scrum. Okay, that's not transformation. That's this, that's fine. We can come train your people and then this is how far you're gonna get and that's it. And we have that same conversation with, okay, so I know you wanna do this and you're the whatever and your company and we can get all this done. And then when it gets to here, it once your influence is exhausted, that's all we can do, right? Unless you get the people above you. Right. So really, really important to understand. So what questions or thoughts do you all have? We've been talking for a bit. Um, we want to answer your questions here tonight. Uh, Olaf raised a question in the chat. Uh, did you get an answer, Olaf? No, I don't think so. What's the, what would you like to know? So the topic of tonight was uh, sustainable change with invitational approach. And I'm wondering if what you're trying to say is that professional coaching in and of itself is the heart of the invitational approach, or is there more to it? Mm, good. Thank you for that question. So the coaching approach is an invitational approach, right? So there is the, I am going to force you to do this. I'm going to tell you what to do. And where coaching is the invitational approach is that Coaching is an invitation to partnership. If I am a, if I am coming in to tell you what to do and what you have to do and how to do it, and I am the smart one and I'm going to fix you, that's that's um, top down, right? It's not invitational. What makes the coaching approach work is its invitational nature. I'm inviting you to be a partner with me. I will partner with you to get done what you want to do. Right. There is they have to invite you to be a partner and they have to accept the invitation to be a partner. You cannot coach someone who does not want to be coached or doesn't know that you're coaching them. Right. And, and, and so that is what makes it the invitational. Right? This is an invitation to partnership and we'll do this together. I won't do it for you. They have to make the change. A lot of the work that I do is, okay, I'm working with the company and we're, we talk through, okay, what's the problem? What is it that we need to change? What needs to be done here? Blah, 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 blah. Great. You go do that. And I'm going to go do something else, but they have to take ownership of the change. I'm not going to change their company for them because if I do, when I leave, it all rolls back. They need to do that. And so that's what that partnership comes in. It's the thought partnership. I'm going to help you figure out what you need to do, how to do it. I'm here to, to think through. I'm going to lend my expertise to your thinking. I'm going to give you observations. What I see, I'll give you my recommendations. You need to do it. I can't go change things for you. And if you're truly partnering with your client, you will never inflict coaching on themselves, on them. 
you will never inflict help on your client. I heard that I was like, that's exactly what's happening so many times. Inflicting help on others and inflicting coaching on others. I'm going to catch you in the hallway and I'm going to coach you. That never works, right? So um, you probably heard, um, I, th I think it was Kanban approach that meet your client where they are, right? That, will, that was kind of their catchy phrase. I heard a modification on that in professional coaching environment, which makes absolute sense. As a coaches, we need to go to the client's bus stop and then invite them to take a ride. I like that. So that's a little that's a little bit kind of a modification. We as coaches need to take that journey ourselves to reach the client where they are. And only then the invitation follows. And guess what? The client might say, not my bus, you go ahead. And uh, if you're a professional coach, if you are an ICF member, you just go away because the client can decline your services and they will be absolutely fine, right? Or they might say, yep, that's the bus. Let's ride it together. And that's where the coaching occurs. Right. Do not inflict coaching on others. <laughs> so I have a clarification on the coaching piece. It's more on the organizational side. So are you suggesting that coaching is usually external and you have somebody come in and do the coaching or can you have full-time coaches in an organization and do these coaches have to be the second part of the question as if yes they can be part of the organization can they be embedded into different organizations or they have to be a separate coaching organization that like a center of excellence what what is the thought process there are you um, asking agile coaches or professional coaches? Agile coaches. Mm -hmm. So I will. I want to change a little bit of what you said. Do they have to? Nobody has to do anything, and there's never one right answer. The answer is always you're you're in agile, right? The answer is always it depends. So yes to all of it, and it depends. In my experience. You can definitely be an internal coach, a full-time employee who's not a consultant, who is a coach in that organization. I, I did it. I did it in large companies. I ran coaching organizations in large companies. And um, it's really, what's the difference between being a full-time employee and a contractor? It's the way you file your taxes. Yes. At the end of the day, the work is the same. Right? And, and so... The, the difference is people start to think differently when they're an employee because there's this false security of, well, I have a job and I have to save my job. So now I need to conform to whatever they're doing instead of what I know is right in some cases. Whereas a consultant, we often won't do that because we're like, well, there's another client right behind them. Either they'll do it or they won't. Right. And so it's all a mental game. So when I worked as a full-time employee, I, I didn't do anything differently in the work I did from when I was consulting to when I was a full-time employee. The only difference was as a consultant, I know I'm coming in with a one-year horizon. And so from day one, I'm talking about, well, I'll be gone in a year. What are you, what are you going to do when I'm gone? As an employee, I have a, about, a, I, I all, my personal is I have a three-year horizon. So I, instead of thinking of, okay, what, what do we need to get accomplished in a year? I'm thinking about where do we need to be three years from now? To me, that was the only difference. Do they need to be centralized or localized? That is a business decision. And what's my personal opinion? Well, I've seen both. My perspective on systems coaching and my experience in systems coaching tells me that um, and it's more, more effective from a system perspective, a full system perspective, when you have a centralized coaching group because 
even though they may all work in different organizations, because that those coaches are a team, they have a joint um, mission and goal, and they share practices and challenges, and you see systemic things better. If I'm in an organization all by myself and doing my own thing, I think my problems are limited to my organization. But if I'm talking to people from other organizations and I'm seeing that they have the same problems, now I'm realizing it's a higher system thing. If I don't know it's a higher system thing, I'm going to try to solve it locally when the problem is actually somewhere else. And so that's one of the values of having people together. Can it be done where you've got individuals in different organizations? Sure. It, it's going to be different. And it may be different in every organization, which could lead to some confusion, but that's totally fine if that's what the client is willing to take. Um, is it enterprise coaching? Absolutely not. It is absolutely only agile adoption if you've got a coaching group that is in different places because they're not doing a thing together. <laughs> they're 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 doing adoption in their separate places. If they were doing transformation, the reason I know that doesn't work is because well, can everybody change the direction of hiring and um, and you know compensation and bonus and all that stuff? Well, we can't change it fifteen different ways, right? And so it's. It's agile adoption, which is totally fine. It's just different. I just want to reiterate one thing. And I literally had this conversation today with a friend who is considering um, mm -hmm. a new uh, position, a new employer. And I took a permanent, a full-time employee job a couple of months ago. And he was asking me, how are you still enjoying your FTE position? And I'm like, just the way I did four months ago, because my tax time is coming and that's how I'm going to, to file my taxes. Do I do anything differently as an employee versus as I would have done as a consultant? Absolutely not. I think, and it's, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a rabbit hole. I think one of the biggest kind of downside of how we think about our jobs is that we are attached to the jobs we're attached to the employment to kind of for for good reasons people need to put bread on their table and that is fine that is understandable and that is so sad because i think by attaching ourselves to our employers just for that we're missing so many opportunities to develop ourselves to enjoy our lives and enjoy our profession so much better right so as i'm working as a full-time employee i'm acting as a consultant and somebody told me uh in my previous consulting role like well you are not employee and i'm like are you suggesting that as a consultant i don't have enough kind of uh skin in the game or what are you suggesting here it's pretty for me, it's pretty offensive to suggest if I'm a consultant, I'm not putting as much on the line as I am an employee. So, and many agile coaches go consulting route. Many agile coaches go a uh, full-time employee route. Uh, I would encourage everybody to see it from the point that it's just the way you file your taxes in the United States. I don't know kind of abroad how it affects you, right? And that actually opens many more doors for you that you, from the kind of from this mindset, full time versus con contractor, you just you just close them for yourselves, right? So it's 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 a useful perspective. I I found it to be very useful. Um, so this is Jay. So there's one huge change that's happening, and I'm working many companies now, and I'm working with one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world right now. So the coaches are the senior executives and the senior directors. They're taking that role now. That is their job. Okay. okay. And they have a specific requirement and a specific responsibility to coach the organization to move into the right direction. So that's their job. Second, they need to hire people to help them move in that direction, which can change depending upon 
you know, the volatility of the market and, and what's going to happen. So what I'm finding out now that the companies that are more aware about what this means and how to do it and how to perform well, they take on the responsibility of coaching, not as much as mentoring and training, you know, they have other people to do that, but from an organizational perspective and a leadership perspective, they take on that role more and more today. Now, I don't know if you all have worked with companies and senior leaders and executives that are doing that. I can list a lot of companies that are doing that today. And it, it's a huge, it's, 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 a, it's a monumental change in the culture and how the organization and the companies adapt. I don't know if you all, have you all seen that? So the thing that comes to me and probably Alex too, because I, I see him smiling is, okay, they say they're coaches and they say they're coaching, but do they even know what that means? I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means. Right. I, I, I would ask, look, look I'm not going to challenge anybody. You say you're coaching, great. Can you tell me what specifically you do that you call coaching? How is that different from anything else you would have done in your VP or senior director position? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, without yeah. any judgment, without any kind of, uh, yeah. oh, you're not coaching. Yeah, yeah, so we have specifics. So if you take Elisa Adkins and others people about the coaching paradigm, and what do you have to do to be a coach? It's coaching, mentoring, training, and, and, and leadership styles. If you take that and you break it down, we apply it specifically to behaviors of the individual and we measure those behaviors. So yes, there are people actually doing that and they're actually measured on those behaviors and those outcomes. Now, like you all said before, that's like one or two percent of, of corporate global corporate world, right? And maybe I just got lucky. I got part of that that interesting vibe that's happening. And there's two other groups that I'm working with that I see that happening. And then I'm curious if if you all are seeing that revolution. It, it's really a revolution. If you're seeing that revolution happening globally, uh, well. I think it, I wouldn't say globally, no. Now, are people learning more about coaching and leading from a coaching stance? It's possible and very much so. I, I ran an organization and I was a coach um, and running the organization and being a coach were two different things. So yes, I was a coach and there were times when I functioned as a coach and there were times when I functioned as your boss. And so for whatever that's worth, I will say that when people say I'm coaching them too, right there is where I, st I stop listening because you're not, not that I stop listening, but I'm like, oh, that's, you see that? I, I, I'm a sales coach. I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? I'm coaching them to do this and make sales. That's not coaching. No. Right. And so that's the thing. Um, can they be successful? Yeah, absolutely. And Olaf, to your question here, can, it, can you coach somebody when you're in a position of power over them? It, it, this is, it, it's a great question and it's, it's the big one, right? Because if I'm in a, if I'm in a position of power over you, then just by virtue of the fact that I'm over you, I'm going to have influence on you whether I want to or not. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as a leader, I did coach some of my employees. And, but it, it still, like, even if for me, I was able to separate out and say, well, that was a coaching conversation. This is performance management. Yeah. They're not connected. It doesn't mean that they would have that same trust, right? Because you are, you're, you've got their livelihood in your hand. And at right. the end of the day, if I'm coaching you and you're trying to go in a direction that is not the way this department is going to go, then at some point I need to put my foot down and say, it's not the way it's going to happen. 
Right. So exactly. it's that I'm coaching you as long as you do it my way. Right. Exactly. And, and leaders have to make that decision, right? You're, you're absolutely correct. I think that coaching also goes with how communication style, the messaging and so forth and how they choose to lead. Right. right? There, and there's a lot of coaching techniques that you can use that helps influence your leadership. Right. So there's coaching skills and coaching skills are good communication skills. Um, and then there's coaching. And so good communication skills are very helpful. Um, and, and Olaf, you've got this other question in the chat about using coaching to kind of bring people along, right? Um, it's probably best for you to explain the question because if I answer it, I might be answering the wrong question. Sure. So if you're if you're referring to the previous one, um, so what I've what I've seen some folks talk about on LinkedIn is um, many agile transformations or whatever we're categorizing them as are imposed on people on 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 everybody who's not in leadership position they are told we are going on an agile journey you're going to work with these coaches um please go along with that and yes. some folks are saying that isn't really an organizationally effective tool because it uh, yeah i don't know what to call it but it, it's like an imposition like that's what what it is it's and what so, Alex calls inflicting coaching on people. <laughs> well, it's not even inflicting coaching on people. It's inflicting agile or whatever the, whatever the thing is on people. And you're not asking them to come along in a way that invites them, but that is, is telling them you are going to do this. So I was thinking whether your panel discussion tonight would include ways of helping people in top leadership understand that maybe an invitational approach for bringing everybody along on the journey would be preferable or how we would go about doing that to, to basically coach leaders to think about using an invitational approach as well. Yeah. And so, go ahead. Let, 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 let me jump in for a moment. Think, think, think about what we already talked about. If leaders step back and they stop thinking about solution, Right. Agility is a solution. We're going to be agile. You're going to be agile. You're going to be doing Scrum. And here's the guy or gal who is going to make you agile. And if leaders step back and they start to think about the outcomes, here's the organizational outcome. We are going to be better positioned in the market. We are going to be better responsive to our customer needs. And here's a proposed solution and at Agile leaders bring the agility mindset, part of which is experimentation. Hey, people, we're going to run this experiment, right? And at the end of the day, that's a money bag. Your, your leader is who is paying for this, right? So we're going to run experiment. And the outcome of this experiment is this, this, and this. Now, here's the guy or gal who can help you, who can help us get there. Go and figure out how you get me these results. I'm here to help. I'm here to help you help me to get to these outcomes. Yeah. I have not changed anything in kind of, in, in the, at the end of the day, the leader will get or will not get these outcomes. Hopefully they will, right? But the approach and the way they communicated down the organization is completely different. I absolutely love when leaders talk outcomes because at the end of the day, it provides everything below so much more space and so many more options, how they can decide, how they can run their lives, their professional lives and their careers right? And how they can be more fulfilled in their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So just a tiny twitch, tiny change in the communication. And again, as coaches, we bring these changes all day long. We help the clients to think in terms of outcomes rather than solutions, right? See if that helps. I, I think it does. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it answers your question, but I think it still helps. 
Well, I think it's one part of the, the of it, right? The other piece is how you run your engagement. So all of I called you to my company. We want to do. We want this agile thing. We've got you found out the problem. We're not delivering. We need stuff in the market. We need to make return on investment. We're bleeding money. Great. Help us to do that. If you run your engagement like, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. Now, we're, everybody, you're going to go agile. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. That probably won't work. However, if you find out, well, what's going on for the leaders? Yes. Okay. Let's get into this. Before we do anything, I'm going to talk to you, the system. I want to under, I want to hear from the system what's wrong and what's broken and what hurts. And because it's more than what the leaders know, it's the people in the weeds who really know. Great example, brand new client working with, we have no technical problems. All of our problems are process. Great, no problem. We're gonna to talk to everybody and find out from them what's going on. You know what their number one problem is? Technology, right? And so, by listening to what your their pain points are, and now we design the engagement to what are your pain points? Let's fix that. We don't, I don't even tell my clients that I know Agile. I just talk to an entire company, everybody in the whole organization I'm working with, and only two people even know I know Agile. Right? I just want to know what hurts and let's figure out how to do it. Right. So it's not about agile. It's about, yeah, agile's a solution. Here's what we can do. Will this help? And so that's how you do the you've got to have that leader support at the top, but it can't be a push down, do it my way. That that usually doesn't work. So um I know we're about um I think we we're about wrapped up unless there's any um, other questions that you've been holding on to that you haven't asked? Yeah, one quick question. Ah, Say the problems are known, but along with the problems, we are also trying to upskill or bring up the level of the team, right? So are there any employer measurement uh, techniques employed to see the effectiveness of coaching or the outcomes that the teams have over, over a period of time achieved? Yes, and they're not measuring Agile. Do not okay. measure Agile, right? Of course. <laughs> so what you want to measure is, so what are the business results you want? What are the changes that you want to see? Where's the pain that you want to see gone? Let's figure out the big question. It's a coaching question. How will you know? How will you know that you've got business results? How will you know you're delivering faster? How will you know you've got return on investment? Let's figure that out and measure those things. And then, um, Alex, if you want to say anything about- We, we, we want it faster. Yeah. How much faster? We want more. <laughs> How much more, right? When when you hear these kind of, this squishy, remember the, I talked about well-formed outcomes they do not allow squishy statements. They actually drill to very specific things. You got to be specific because as the Cheshire cat said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So you need the specifics. And I would invite you to download uh, EBM, Evidence-Based Management Guide from Scrum.org. Absolutely fantastic work. Um, one kind of caution, word of caution, don't take it as the, take it as a guide. Don't take it as a Bible of measurements because I see this all the time. I tell people, go read that. And then they come back and say, we read this and we got this 18 measurements from the, from the appendix A and we implemented them all. I'm like, <laughs> you didn't. No, we did. Haven't you read that? Every measurement is enterprise context specific. These are samples of what you can consider, right? Again, if I give you EBM and say, here's the Bible, I just inflicted coaching on you. Right. Don't inflict coaching on your customers, on your clients. That's the guide. And if you want to know more about enterprise-based metrics, evidence-based management, 
read the guide, absolute fantastic read. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the key is um, understanding where you are and where you want to be. And when I build out my engagements, I don't just, it, it's not measures of success, it's measures of progress and success. I don't just want to know when I got there. I want to know when I'm moving in the right direction, right? Because nothing happens overnight. And so we want to be able to see over time that we've got progress. These 12 things will tell me we're making progress. Right? So if one or two are changing, now we know we're making some progress. We not, may not be there, but we're making progress. And um, so if you're measuring agile practices and stuff, you're measuring the wrong stuff, right? How many agile teams you got? How many projects have turned agile? How many people went to training? All those things are vanity metrics. It's like saying the team that finds the most bugs is gonna get you know, a big bonus. And then you've got people saying, oh, let's go write a new house, right? We're gonna find a lot of bugs. I'm gonna write them, you're gonna find them. Right? You'll, get, <laughs> you'll get what you measure. They, they call it collusion in any <laughs> criminal codex or something. Yeah. And, and so Agile is not the goal. Don't measure Agile stuff. Measure business results. Measure change in the right direction. Right? We want to see something move from this percentage to a, to a, we want to improve from here to here. We want to be in a range of here to here, right? Not, not, or four, or four teams doing a daily scrum. So my big argument against, like when people say, well, we've got to measure like, are you doing your daily scrum? Are you doing this? Are you doing this meeting? Are you do, doing this meeting? So let me get this right. I have a client who's saying I'm bleeding money. And you are saying that as long as teams meet for 15 minutes and they answer three questions, that's going to stop the bleeding of money. Is that what you're telling me? The worst thing you can hear from a Scrum master, if you're not doing your daily Scrums, you're not doing Scrum. Guess what my question is? So the F what? <laughs> right. And so it's like, Measure, measure what makes sense and do what makes sense. Right? All right. All right. Well, thank you both. And I think that's a very important for everyone to learn from this is, you know, we've got to measure what, what matters, right? And, and everything we do in a company and organization has to be tracked back to those business realizations or customer realizations or whatever it is that we want to do better, right? How are we going to improve, right? And how are we going to sustain our, our company and, and, and be successful? So that's, that's very good. And, it, and I think that's very hard for many people going through an agile adoption or transformation is how do I link those to the real measurements that really make a difference for the company and the organization? And, and I'm, I'm hoping that companies are, are getting that message that you are telling them and and they're learning to apply it so i think that's critical and important so thank you thank you both go ahead ron oh were you gonna say something yeah um i'm curious is is tandem the two of you or is it more than that and and it looks like maybe you came together to create tandem and so how did you meet and how did you form tandem and so know? i i will tell you that tandem is not a bike <laughs> I actually heard like tandem coaching. I'm like, that's a weird, like, what is she doing on the bike? So apparently Cherie is, well, she, she looks benign and all that, but she does crazy things. She goes and do zip lining. She goes and jump off the freaking plane. Like, seriously, I get on the plane. I buckle myself down and I see it until they say, we have arrived. She doesn't wait for that. She goes right off the plane and jump in tandem. So it's That's a great metaphor. And so when you jump with somebody on your back, you have to work in tandem to actually not ending up in a pile of goo on ground, right? So 
Yep. And coaching is, it's about partnership, right? And so that's why I picked the name Tandem Coaching. I had Tandem Coaching before I met Alex. He came through initially as a student and then basically called me up one day and said, your online stuff sucks. Can I fix it? And then I never let him go after that. <laughs> and so we formed Tandem, Co Tandem Coaching Partners, and we are the partners who run that company. And um, as needed, we bring people in to help with engagements or training or whatever. We're not a staffing company. We are a coaching and training company. So we do enterprise coaching. We also do individual, a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching and executive coaching. Um, and we do training of um, coaches. So we do some mm -hmm. agile training, um, but our primary is training agilists in professional coaching. Um, many of our students are ag agile coaches, scrum masters, um, managers, some product owners, um, but many of our students are agilists, not all of them, because professional coaching is professional coaching. So you're able to award ICF, um, ICF um, associate, uh, I forget what it's called, it's a accredited disease. We, yep. we, which which right we train to the level of PCC. We, we 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 don't train to ACC level. That's that's boring. And I will tell you that if somebody train you to ACC level, that's great. And you will come to if you want to continue, you will have to break a lot of habits. They will train you in ACC class, right? So Alex, how did you find Cherie? So you I, 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 or her student. Re remember, I had the checklist and I Googled how do I get this MCC thing? I, I, I was going for the top. I was like, I need MCC and I need it in, in the next three months. And then I was like, oh, crap, you can't. All right, let's figure out how to do PCC. And I Googled her, right? So uh, at the end of the day, um, we train to PCC level. We don't bother with AC. ACC is great, and we don't think it's enough. It, we don't think it's enough for agile coaches, right? So, no, okay. so I, wasn't, I wasn't really asking about ACC, PCC, MCC. I was just trying to figure out where, where, where in, the, in the universe you were and how you came together. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, we are. That's how we came together. We decided to get in partnership. Alex has a lot of strengths that I don't have, and I have other strengths. So we decided to come together as partners, and um, we um, we do have an a, a, an accredited um, coach training program with ICF. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and as someone who worked at a company that built refrigerators that were, pardon me, computers that were the size of about four refrigerators. <laughs> Um, the word tandem sounds like theft to me. <laughs> yeah, there was tandem computers. I, uh, I that, was the, yes. that was the very first thing I thought of, David, when I yeah. saw tandem coaching behind Cherie was, did you get permission to use that? Exactly. <laughs> and it, and it almost, almost computing, looks yes. like the same, the same laddering and everything, right? Yeah. Oh, really? How funny. Is, is Guardian uh, in, in anywhere in the names of your products? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you wanted to know where we came from. Nope, nothing to do with any of those people. We uh, just, I just jumped out of an airplane one day and said, I think I want to call my company this. Okay. Oh, that's, a, that's good. Cool. Well, again, I want to thank thank everyone. I know we're we're over time, and and I and look, I applaud Sheree and Alex for continuing the coaching profession. It's and I, it's it's really evolved. Like I've been doing this for forty something years, but the last ten or fifteen years, I see this as a major profession that more and more companies want, and 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 there's and there's a desire to have have this capability and confidence. So thank you, Sheree. And Alex for continuing this in, in the world. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for coming here and learning. And so now I'll say adieu. Uh, this will be recorded. Oh, yeah, I keep saying this. I'm gonna load it, load it up to YouTube and and I'll, I'll we'll make time to do it. And 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 and, and, and I'll send everyone a, 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 a I use meet up and I'll send you the connector, but we have our YouTube channel and all this is out there. So again, Cherie and Alex, thank you so much. We learned a lot and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.
Good night. Bye.